suis impressionné par la logique. Parce que nous, nous étions un petit temps passé. On a des minutes dehors. Ah oui. Ah ouais. Ah ouais. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. We're still expecting some more people to um, show up. Sorry, this. Um, and uh, so they'll have to probably start a little bit uh, late. I'll make some announcements. So um, when we finish, we'll go downstairs to the bar. There's a nice bar. It's the first time we're here. This used to be called the Lloyd's Club. I, I, I just noticed I'm doing the Trump kind of gesture. I should be a bit more original. So, uh, <laughs> we, we, um, it's the first time we're actually here um, at, the, um, at, at the new City University Club. So some of you came to the, to the old City University Club in Cornhill. So now it has moved to this location, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a historic location. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's in, in Cratchit Friars, right? Which, you know, people might, might, might uh, think what uh, Cratchit means, mm -hmm. right? In fact, it's, uh, it's Frere Cruciferi, so it used to be a, an order, a religious order, that was based here, right? It, it was a, uh, basically a monastic order, uh, which has a very interesting history. And uh, like many other orders, the founder of my Oxford College, Henry VIII, who kind of dealt, dealt away with it uh, at some point in time. Uh, it's quite, quite an interesting, but they have a very interesting history, if you actually look up Pratchett Friars and what they did and uh, the various places where they were located. They were, apart from England, they were located in France, in Belgium, and many other places. It's interesting to uh, read up on that. There is a sculpture nearby of the of two uh, brethren um, that, uh, you know, of, of, of this order uh, that are now called the Cratchit Friars. Uh, hence this interesting location. Uh, City University Club started off as a Cambridge and Oxford club. Um, and then, of course, then there is an Oxford and Cambridge club which opened in, um, in Green Park and then it became the university club, start, started uh, accepting members from other universities and then basically the institution was located in Cornhill for quite, quite some time and then it moved here, right, recently. So some of you came to our Telesian talks um, at, uh, at City University Club in Cornhill. So this is the new location and we'll explore the bar today after the lecture. I just wanted to say a couple of words about our sponsor, Tequila, Next Generation Grid. Uh, they create software, and the sponsors, our sponsors provide food maps. They create software that allows you to massively parallelize your computations. Um, and literally, it can be done in just a couple of uh, lines of Python. You know, you can, you can take your algorithm and you can take it to the grid very, very quickly. You can do this in MATLAB and many other and many other uh, things. One interesting example that I saw uh, Torma run, uh, they're applying this to cancer research, uh, they're analyzing a lot of um, imagery, um, and they're doing it very, very quickly. So something that would otherwise take about 14 years could be done in an hour using uh, Tequila's software. And of course, it's, not applic not, it's applicable across the entire um, range of uh, mathematical finance we need to calibrate, you can do it on the grid, machine learning where you can calibrate your neural networks, and basically medicine is one, of, one other application engineering, so talk to these guys if you want very quick, very powerful um, um, parallelization in Python in literally just very, very little code. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have our Vienna organizer here, Hans Peter. He is fashionably late, uh, <laughs> but what I wanted to say, they had this event in Vienna, the first lesson event in Vienna. How many people came? Uh, 56. 56 people came to the first lesson talk in uh, Vienna, and we had Ivan Stankin and uh, Duke Vier Machado present two talks, actually, one evening. It was very, very, um, very uh, well, well received in Vienna, so it's great to be there. Of course, we are founding at the same time, we, are, we, are, we, we have founded the lessons Paris, and to lessons Lisbon. So the Paris talk, the first talk is due to take place very soon. Um, I'll keep you posted. In the meantime, I'll, I'll just mention uh, real quick uh, who our next speakers are, um, so that you, you keep... We try not to make it clash with football. So hopefully, those of you who, of course, we understand that football takes precedence over even to lesson talks, um, but uh, we have been quite careful, I think, with our... And, of course, when it takes place in Marriott, you can join us for, you know, you can watch football later at the bar, actually, or here, 
because actually the next talk, unlike most other talks, it actually starts at 6. We usually start at 6.30, right? But the next talk will be by... Uh, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. The next talk will be in New York, and it will be on 20th of June by Casper Larson, right, who will talk about smart TWAP trading in continuous time equilibrium. That's in New York. Harvey, Harvey Stein is organizing that, and that's 20th of June. Right? And if you happen to be in New York, and if you're interested in uh, trading, that, that's, that's the talk to go to. On the 27th of June, um, it, that one we are starting at 6, not 6.30. That's, uh, we usually start at 6.30, but that one is going to be starting at 6. Is by uh, Professor Demiane Briga, and Demiane will talk about rogue traders with S-shaped utility versus VAR and expect a shortfall. So we'll talk about how you, how you look at different risk measures right, and, uh, and utilities. On Wednesday, the 11th of July, we have our first talk on uh, quantum computing. Sophie Bismuth will be introducing the basics of quantum computation, how it's done, what's involved. She'll introduce the theory of quantum computation. She'll talk about the state of quantum computation now, because as you know, there are quantum computers now, right? And uh, they are available. And she'll also talk about the applications of quantum computation across different finance, medicine, so in medicine, what, what people are, are doing, once quantum computers are available, they will be able to, pro to model process at the level of individual cells, right, which is what people are basically aiming to do in quantum computing. Uh, that's 11th of July. Again, it's going to be here. It's going to be here. Demiana's talk is going to be in, in Canary Wharf. On 25th of July, again in Canary Wharf, at 6.30 as usual, there will be a talk by Esther Vershoff who will talk about um, explaining and stopping pattern formation in, in, in cancerous tumors, right? So that will be a very interesting talk, our first medical talk, with applications of mathematical modeling in the field of medicine. So bring your friends interested in medicine. That's going to be on Wednesday, the 25th of July. So we have quite a few talks over the next month and a half coming up. Uh, so please join us. Um, quite a few of them are. We, we, we have Demiana Briga, who's my boss from Imperial College, who will be presenting uh, in Canary Wharf, right? Um, and of course, it's a huge pleasure to introduce today's talk, which is uh, entitled, Is there a reward for macroeconomic risk in high moment risk premium? I'm not going to waste too much time. I'll just very, very briefly introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, Ian uh, Krasiewski, who is a PhD student in finance at Stockholm Business School. Um, and he's working on his dissertation right now, which is entitled Essays on Risk in Investment Strategies. Um, his main research interests are asset pricing, behavioral finance, and risk management. So it's a huge pleasure to welcome Ian today, and without further ado, Ian. Um, well, first of all, um, thank you very much to Thalesians for organizing this seminar, and a special thanks to Paul for inviting me. Um, so. I will straight jump into this. We have uh, some time though, but uh, before I'm going to start about higher moments, when I speak about higher moments, I speak about higher statistical moments like variance, skewness and kurtosis. This is going to be the main focus of this paper and you can, you can see them in any asset class, but what we're going to speak about is equities in this, paper, uh, in this talk. Another thing is the risk premium. Usually when we talk about the risk premium and we talk about equities, we talk about the risk premium we get for bearing the risk of equities. However, here think of the risk premium in the following way. You're an investor who is afraid of risks which are coming from variance or from skewness or from kurtosis, and you would like to hedge them. When you hedge these risks, you pay a certain amount of money or whatever, and then this amount, the cost you have, I will call it a risk premium. So just to get started, it actually exists. It's nothing that I came up to make this talk. So there are investors who are afraid of risk, and these are just some of the um, uh, newspaper headlines who want to hedge this risk and who want to get the protection against something extreme like crisis. And then also there are companies or agents who would like to sell it. Putting it in a bit... Um, kind of formal way and kind of linking it to the actual research and literature. Well, first of all, we have investors who care about 
uh, higher moments and it's proven that they do. So first of all I would like to mention the paper of Rubinstein 1994 published in Journal of Finance who talks about the crashophobia. And the crashophobia, what is this? Well, it's just the fact that investors, they take too, put too much weight to the extreme event or to the left tail of the distribution. And how you can see this? Well, you can see it when you observe the volatility smile in options. Next, we have a paper coming from Behavioral Finance of Barbaris and Huan 2008 in, from Journal of Financial Economics. Well, what they say that investors actually have preferences to a skewness or kurtosis. And they may not really understand it, but when they choose the stocks which they include in their portfolio, it just happens that they usually overweight the stocks with uh, high positive skewness. But if, if investors do care about higher moments, then we actually need have to see it somehow reflected in the prices and it actually happens. So there are a couple of papers, I'm not going to go through all of them. The honorable mention is a paper of Capada 2006 who just showed that, well, because there is some preference for skewness, the stocks which usually have high positive skewness, they underperform in long run because they get overpriced very quickly. But if your statistician uh, concept of higher moments is kind of understandable, but when you put them in, con in finance field, it may become a little bit vague and hard to interpret. The interpretation of variance is quite straightforward, but when it comes to kurtosis or skewness, the interpretation starts to vary. And then the question is, do they arise just because it's uh, some kind of uh, distributional assumptions or it's actually related to some real phenomena. And, it, it, and there are papers who actually show that it does relate it to macro, to macro economy. In particular, there are two papers, uh, Paris Quinnis and Timmerman, Flannery and Protopodakis. Well, what they show is that you will not be able to see how macroeconomic variables change the returns because they don't really change them. They change the distribution of these returns while they are coming out. And they, and they prove it in their papers. And these two papers are actually a breakthrough because before them, all of the research was focusing just on one field, looking at the returns themselves and at the macroeconomy. And they couldn't really find the connection. The empirical evidence was not able. They were very hard to establish it. Then there are also a couple of papers that show that, well, macroeconomic risk, it it actually has a forecasting power over future higher moments because the macroeconomic changes, they're quite severe in the economy, that they give the rise of the predictability. All right, now I was speaking about higher moments, but then we have investors who would like to hedge it. So what about the premium or the cost of this hedging? Well, before I start from this, there is a paper from of Bandarenga 2004 who links the hedge fund returns and hedge fund alphas they generate to actually to sell in the insurance against higher moments. He shows that you can explain a large variability in, the, uh, in hedge fund alphas if you just focus on this higher moment risk premium. Then there is another paper, and I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail in this, of Koja, Neuberger and Schneider, 2013. Well, this paper is really important because what, unlike all the previous ones, they brought these concepts of higher moment, moments into the market for the traders. They showed how you can trade them in real life. And before, you, can, you could trade variance with variance swaps, but for example, skewness, or kurtosis. There are no evidence, but what they did, they actually show how you can construct these portfolios and trade them. I'm going to go through their method a little bit further in this presentation. Uh, another honorable mention is Schneider 2015, who explains all of the higher moments from perspective of KPM and embeds it into the model um, and makes it kind of a really good uh, fun, uh, kind of theoretical framework to continue. But however, though we establish that there is high, that there are high moments and they have premier and this premier is time varying, it's not really known whether when you buy the protection against these higher moments, uh, do the cost you pay for this protection, is it determined by the market risk or is it also determined by some other factors? In fact, what drives this higher moment risk premium is not really well documented. 
So uh, what I'm going to speak about today, and I will try to prove it to you, that, well, there is a link between macroeconomy and higher moments risk premium. In particular, I'm going to answer this question. Is there a reward, reward in higher moment risk premium? Is the high moment risk premium driven by macro by some other factors apart from the macro uh, market risk such as um, macroeconomic conditions and we're going to start here from two hints which we have from the literature first one is again this paper caution from 2013 and when they calculated this higher moment risk premium what they showed is that well actually all of this higher moment risk premium is driven by some common factor then the paper of Schneider 2015 linked this common factor to general risk aversion. So putting it intuitively, if you're buying insurance, there is some common factors that determine how much you have to pay for this insurance. This is what they said. And when you buy the insurance, what determines what amount of money you have to pay for it is linked to risk aversion. This is the Schneider paper says. Um, I really like spoilers, so I'm going to say the main findings directly so that you know where I'm going to. Indeed, what I find is that not only market risk is priced in or kind of drives this cost of insurance or high moment risk premium, but also there is evidence that macroeconomic risk drives it and explains it. Moreover, I find that not one component, but actually two components uh, is are priced and drive this price on for any um, high moment risk premium, whether it's variance, skewness, or kurtosis. And this is, of course, the market risk and financial constraints. I'm going to speak a little bit later about the financial constraints and how I define all of these things. But finally, I don't find any predictability, which is bad for us, but this predictability does not come from uh, macroeconomic variables. So observing them, you will not be able really to predict the premium. All right, um, the data. Well, this is an empirical paper and uh, of course it's very important for me to say for which this results holds. Um, of course you can extrapolate them on others if you change the data, but what I'm using, I'm using out of the money options on S&P 500 futures uh, starting from 1996 to 2017. Um, I also collect 35 different macroeconomic variables um, from the publicly available database of St. Louis Fred, which collects all of the data from the um, different uh, um, the, um, US agencies and puts them in one place. Um, I also group them into four group, or five groups, inflation, employment, sentiment, output and financial constraints. Um, you will understand why this grouping is important in the, next, in the following steps. And finally, I also control for VIX and excess returns on S&P 500 in index, which I call excess return of the market. It's quite standard th thinking that S&P 500 represents the market portfolio. All right, um, now the presentation is going to be structured in a couple of blocks. Uh, so the first block, I will speak about the premium itself and how you get it and how it is possible for you to trade it. Then secondly, I will speak a little bit about the macroeconomic variables because it's very important how you treat them. Finally, I will present the empirical evidence and some discussion. So defining high moment risk premium in more mathematical terms is just a difference between the physical probability and the uh, risk neutral probability. So we take the expectation under the physical measure P of some payout function G of log of log returns and introduction of this function is important because uh, I'm using the um, framework of Neuberger and Korsan and uh, in essence what it means this is your realized moment this is your implied moment implied moment you take from options and they are it is a forward-looking measure whereas the realized moments you only know after you have after some time passed. So it's a backward looking measure. The risk premium then, it's a difference between them. And because this is a backward looking measure, it's varying over time. So this is called a floating lag of the risk premium. Whereas this measure, we, it's fixed and we know it at the moment we ante in the trade. So this is going to be 
a fixed uh, lag. So then trading the any uh, risk premium associated with higher moment is possible just by constructing a swap where you have two counterparties which one gives the uh, risk exposure to the, high, to the variability of higher moments and another one takes it. And the, then the cost of this transaction is called risk premium. So in essence what they do, this swap can be constructed uh, from options and futures. And the reason you use options and in particular out of the money options because there is an evidence that you can replicate any payoff you want just with the portfolio of out of the money options. And here are two papers as a reference for this. It's called a spanning theorem. Uh, of course it's theory, in practice it's uh, going to be a well enough approximation but well. Um, and then to receive a swap uh, which trades, for example, variance risk premium, which stands for VRP or skewness risk premium for SRP, you just uh, set this uh, payoff function of log returns to this functional form. So you, in essence, need to construct a portfolio of, which consists from out-of-the-money options, which will give you this payoff. This, and you get, take the expectations, you get variance risk premium, to construct skewness risk premium, put this into the formula we, I, saw, I showed in the previous slide, you get the skewness risk premium. And th they show the framework which can be applied for any, uh, for any high moment up to the nth moment. Uh, my contribution here is that I show it for kurtosis because they only focus on variance and skewness. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to speak more about it. So. Uh, well, this is just a small graph for you to understand how everything is calculated. At time t, and this is going to be expiration of one options on S&P 500 futures, we enter into the, uh, into the trade and we wait up until its exp uh, expiration at t plus 1. And this is going to be our trade in month. So it's from the third Friday of one month to the third Friday of the next month. Um, the thing is, we form the portfolio time t, but to ensure that it actually maps the variance of skewness risk premium or kurtosis risk premium, we need to rebalance it and we do the daily rebalancing. In theory, you actually have to do the continuous rebalancing to ensure that it uh, tracks the moment uh, precisely, but anyway. So we have a monthly data and the monthly trading strategies. Moreover, what I do as well is that I uh, standardize risk premia by the implied moment and then the whole formulation is that it gives me excess return over the one dollar invested in the implied moment. Alright, and then I have the data from January 1996 to, to December 2017. Alright, uh, when you calculated this, these are going to be the main descriptive statistics. So you, have, uh, you see that all of the signs here are negative, which means that it costs you to hedge the risk for, uh, coming from the variance, skewness or kurtosis. Inter interestingly, I would like to point out that all of the risk premia associated with high moments are highly correlated. And this I would like you to keep in mind because we will come back to particularly this table a bit later when I'm going to speak about the empirical results. And for you to kind of have an idea how it looks like, this is how it looks like. It's quite persistent, and, but there are quite a lot of jumps. The shaded areas over here, these are the recessions in the US. <clears throat> All right, now we're coming to macroeconomic variables. And I think this is much more uh, user-friendly than the previous slides. So here I just collect 35 different macroeconomic variables. I can show the list, the full list of them if someone needs them. I have it over here, but I'm not going to waste my time on this. Uh, the numbers on the parentheses are actually the numbers of variables uh, in each group. And uh, if you are interested more about this method, there is a good paper of Baber Brandt and Luisi of 2015. Actually, uh, Baber is from the CAS school in London. Um, they use, they show how, they, how the group is done for the first four groups, whereas my contribution here is that I show how you can also construct the financial constraint group, which will give you idea about the financial constraints 
in the economy. And given talking about what is financial constraints, for those of you who are not familiar with this literature, well, if you have a hedge fund, you are kind, you're always going to be financially bounded uh, with the money of funds you can raise. And it's going to be different in different times. For instance, good indicator in 2008 when there was a liquidity dry out in the market, so you, it was hard to raise extra money to finance some risky arbitrage or, finance, or investment strategies. All right, for financial constraints group, um, I just added TED spread default yield and the reason I added them because there are some papers which links them to financial constraints of hedge funds like Funding Xie and uh, Kao Chen Lin and Lu. Then other tools I were used in the previous literature to as a kind of proxy of discount rate. So in essence, financial constraints are going to be a cost of capital. Think of it in this way. Um, all right. So. This is a slide to give you some intuition of what I'm going to perform with these macro variables. Um, because it's quite a tricky thing, but once you get the intuitive intuition, it becomes much easier. So this is a picture I took the, the time when I was walking around the city. And imagine that each building represents a certain group of macroeconomic variables. And what I try to do, I try to name each group by a certain color. I don't say that this color is going to be unique for this building, but, this, but it will characterize the color of this building more certainly. So what I do first, I define the whole uh, spectra of colors for each building, and then I kind of orthogonalize them, kind of selecting a unique color for each building. So this will become um, much um, more understanding once you look at the data. So this is an example of the macroeconomic variables we have. Um, the problem with them, they are very, it's usually very messy data and it's very hard to treat it because some of the series, they are not of the you know, same frequency, some of it, they are of a different length and so on. So we have a daily, uh, here I collect it on a daily frequency, but this, it doesn't really matter. You can collect them on any frequency you want because the method is quite universal. And in times when you don't have any releases or there are kind of gaps in your data, what you do, you just forward fill it with the most recent realization of it. Think of it in the way that, well, uh, this is the best forecast you can have given the, all the information you have. And of course we could uh, do here a lot of extensions like putting some Kalman filters and so on, but for the sake of, the, of, of this paper and for this question, this is good enough representation. Um, so next what I'm doing, at any given time t, so for instance I'm standing here, up to year 1980, I, I can calculate the correlation matrix uh, <coughs> omega t, and with this correlation matrix I extract first principal component for each group. I do quite a bunch of adjustments, but uh, I will skip it for the sake of time. And once we did it, we received these data. Again, the shaded areas are the recession periods. And this is data starting from 1996 to, to the end of 2017. So we have employment, output, financial constraints, inflation, uh, sentiment, and I also include VIX for comparison. So these are components, these are principal components, but it's proven that they attract the dynamics of the, uh, macro, of the particular macroeconomic uh, process pretty well. However, as you can see, all of them, they're highly correlated, and actually some of them were going to have quite a lot of uh, autocorrelation. So, for the, our empirical exercise to show that uh, there is a relationship between these components and the high moment risk premium, it will be quite messy and it will be problematic. So we are going to do certain tricks. So the first trick what I'm going to do is control for outer correlations in the series by just fitting an armor model and the armor model is fitted by using the Bayesian information criteria. So in essence, I'm taking out all of the outer correlations from the series and I just use the residuals in my further research. So these are going to be clean residuals, they're not going to have outer correlations. It means that the, there's no, the current realization is not related to the previous ones. However, still, 
they're going to be cross-correlated because we cannot really say that inflation goes up without speaking all other uh, components of macroeconomy. So we need to find some smart way to orthogonalize it. And the way I decided to go with, it's close to Ludwigsen and NG2009, and in essence it means that I take the eigen decomposition of my variables. Uh, putting it a bit uh, kind of to the same language we were speaking, I'm taking again the PCA analysis, but I don't call it PCA for the reason that it serves different purpose. It just gives, it, gives me the orthogonal values, or orthogonal macroeconomic components, which are referred to OMC as OMC. But the problem is when you do this step, you actually lose uh, the grouping we did before. So you have to remap them to the previous groups we had. And this is what we're going to do. So here, in this group, we have our previous variables that we were using, employment, inflation, output sentiment, and financial constraints from step one, which I showed you. <clears throat> and then here we have actually these orthogonal components. And the mapping is done by using the correlations. So for instance, the first group, we see that it has a perfect correlation with VIX, so we'll call it a market risk because it also is highly correlated with excess return on S&P 500 and financial constraints. The second group, we see that it's highly correlated with output. So what I will call it, I will call it output. And the caution has to be here. I don't, I don't say that this uh, orthogonal macroeconomic component 2 represents only output and that all, all other components do not represent output. Rather, it represents the orthogonal part of output orthogonal to all of the other components. So this gives me a really good idea of identification and how and what is going on in each of the series. So, so, so are yes. you saying that, that the first component is pretty much the VIX as uh, yes. the market volatility? Yeah. So, so, it, so it has absolutely perfect correlation? With, uh, yeah, it has absolutely perfect correlation. It says, uh, so, and actually if you look, the, it explains 8 to 6.1% of common variation between the components. Yeah. And this is alongside uh, the previous research which says that VIX is a really good indicator of the risk in the economy and, market, uh, and actually macroeconomic risk. And, and so the, the, uh, the financial constraints kind of... Um, uh, the most of that. Yeah, so the, the financial constraints here, first of all, look here that the here correlation between actual component for financial constraints is 0.41. So market risk will incorporate some of the risk coming from financial constraints. But also these financial constraints will have some risk which is kind of not incorporated in VIX and it's very, it's very specific because it's uh, only, only kind of it has very small explained variance, just 0.5%. Right. But it doesn't mean that it's not important. It means that it just in, it not explains common variation. But it has something in itself which makes it kind of also important. So we cannot really just throw it away because it doesn't explain common stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very kind of nice interpretation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think of it, if you try to build a program which, has, which does facial recognition, right? You would like to, even if you'd like to do the facial, facial recognition of people, you would be ex interested in what explains the common, uh, the, 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 the common features like oval faces and so on. But if you would like to do some kind of fingerprint sensor which focuses on particularly uh, certain parts which are unique for the data set, you will actually not be interested in these parts, you will be interested in the parts which makes it unique. And this step is mostly here just to make it orthogonal. Um, yeah. But uh, just to show you that it doesn't really change the data, here is the data before, so before doing, the, after the first step, before doing the armor modeling and before doing this orthog orthogonal transition, and this is the data after this. And you see it's quite similar. I mean, this is more stable because we take, uh, we're taking, we're working with the residuals which have zero autocorrelation. All right, um, any more questions here before I continue? We're good on time? We, we, we can overrun. Uh, uh, Which uh, one of those is VIX on the, on the left? Or is it none of them? Um, this is not VIX. This is market risk. So uh, no, let, on, the left. on the left, VIX is here. 
So VIX financial constraints, uh, employment output, you know, uh, uh, sentiment, output, inflation, and employment. Is it bizarre that you've taken autocorrelation out and you still have a perfect correlation with your with your thing on the right? Uh, well, uh, I'm not so when I'm taking the correlation in here. Oh, sorry. Well, these are already after armor model fitting. Ah, okay. Right. So, um, okay. Sorry, okay. I, I should have said it. Right. It's a good point. So yeah, um, but these are before treatment, just yes. because you saw it, and this is after all of the treatments, and you see they're pretty close to each other. So next, we have all of the ingredients to answer our question. We have our risk premium, and we have our macroeconomic components. And what we're going to do? Well, we're just going to run a regression. And we can do it because we created more or less a perfect setup. Uh, I ensured that all of the risk premium is stationary and everything, so this, uh, there is no non-stationarity issues, just to be clear. But there is one problem. Variance risk premium, skewness and kurtosis, they are highly correlated. Some papers, they try to also orthogonalize them just to identify which is which, is which but I don't do this because, well, if you're going to trade, you're going still to receive some of the correlation anyway, so there is no point. But what I do instead, I run this regression for different risk premia, so different regressions for variance, skewness, and kurtosis. So here is the respective risk premia. This is a lagged value, so for risk premia come from the last month, just a just to control in case there is any autocorrelation. Then we have our set of contemporaneous macroeconomic vari or orthogonal macroeconomic components. These are the lagged orth or orthogonal macroeconomic components and some error term. And I'm going to run three specifications of this uh, regression. One I call explanatory, or rather I was, should say contemporaneous because I just exclude the lagged component xt minus 1 from it. For the predictive one, I, I exclude the comp contemporaneous component from here. And then finally, I do the joint regression running everything jointly. And uh, here are some results. <clears throat> so. First of all, adjusted R squares, um, pretty low, but more or less okay. Uh, F statistics, here I show, actually it's not F statistics, but P values associated with F statistics, with null hypothesis that all of them are jointly equal to zero. So F statistics zero means that it's very unlikely that all of them jointly equal to zero. And these are number of observations which used in the series. The thing you have to look at here is market risk and financial constraints. These are the coefficients and the number in parentheses are the respective t statistics. So first what we can see is that market risk, all of the coefficients are positive and highly significant, as well as for financial constraints, which are positive and highly significant. Well, for the market risk it implies that when you try to buy some insurance against higher moment risk, market risk will be priced and you will get compensated once the market risk goes up because if you see if market risk becomes more positive then all of the premium will become more positive as well however with the financial constraints it's very interesting because apparently variance risk premium gives a better compensation if there is a more tighter financial constraint so if the, it's harder for you to get some extra funding and why it is important? Because when the financial constraints become tight, the markets become less efficient. It's, it's much harder for market makers to do their job in market, in market making. It's also harder for hedge funds to ensure the efficiency of the market. Inter interestingly, that variance risk premium compensates for financial constraints more than the kurtosis. If you, you can see that the coefficients differ more than by 30%. But not only this, apparently there are not only common factors that drive this variability in the cost of insurance, but also different, uh, different uh, risk premia is driven by different macroeconomic variables. In particular, look at the inflation and sentiment. It shows that, well, unlike variance risk premia, skewness and kurtosis gives you protection against these macroeconomic phenomena as well. 
In particular, skewness and kurtosis risk premia compensates for low inflation states. So once inflation goes lower, you are getting compensated by skewness and kurtosis risk premia because it becomes much uh, because it becomes more positive. It also gives a protection against negative sentiment, so or lower sentiment. Once the sentiment goes lower, so the market participants, they become more pessimistic about the economy, skewness risk premia and kurtosis risk premia gives you the compensation. So for instance, um, one of the good intuition why it, will, uh, why it should hold, when sentiment goes down, usually the prices will go down then well, the skewness will become more negative and then you get compensated for change in skewness. And then interestingly, and when I first got this result, that positive sign over here with the kurtosis risk premium and high significance at the beginning scared me a little bit. But after digging a little, after digging more into previous research, it's actually not that surprising that kurtosis gives you the compensation for higher employment states. So as employment becomes higher, you are getting compensated by kurtosis. And um, actually it's more a byproduct of the data than actually kind of macroeconomic interpretation because it's, uh, and this is documented before. So, First of all, there is a paper back in 1993 which says that good news about macroeconomy are not really good for stock market when when in good states because the market participants think of it that it actually the next recession comes closer so they start pricing this next recession into the prices and the particular uh, becomes with employment. The paper of, and I'm sorry I have to look at it, Boyd who, and Yaganathan from 2015, um, what they look at, they look at the implications of the employment and the stock prices and what they show is that it's true that when employment becomes higher usually the stock market <coughs> underperforms because um, Investors l look in the rise in employment as a sign of the changes in interest rates and start pricing it into the market. And it usually happens in good states, but in the bad states, the fall in employment is really bad for the market. But because there are not that much of the bad states, you just get these results. All right. Um, then I do some predictive regressions to see whether there is a predictability arising from changing macroeconomic conditions. Um, I find some significant results, but as you can see, adjusted R squares quite low, though the F statistics are significant. But once we control for the contemporaneous realization of macroeconomic conditions, we actually don't find any predictability. Adjusted R squares also, as you can see, they actually become lower or comparing to the times when we are uh, looking at the contemporaneous results. And it all gives me to the conclusion that, well, there is no significant predictability arising from changing macroeconomic conditions which are related to uh, future high moments risk premium. All right, then the question is, how robust are these results? And this is what I'm working on right now. Uh, I don't think the results are going to be added more. It's only the robustness test which are required to answer the question. So, so far um, I looked at the lagged risk premia. I excluded it, didn't change the results. I also looked at the uh, lagged regressions or the quantile regressions. More or less it's, it's controlling for the outliers we have in, in the data. Well, in fact, the results become even stronger. And then finally, I, I also experimented by looking at the squared components, kind of a realized uh, variance of these components, but the identification becomes very tricky in general, and uh, also it doesn't really change the results in general. So if you have any suggestions, I will be gladly and happily listen to them. But uh, we are actually good on time, so I'm going to finish right now with a conclusion. Uh, macro, so in this talk and in this paper what I looked at was uh, the higher moment risk premium, which is a cost of insurance. And before what, the, what it was said is that this cost of insurance is driven by some common factors in the market, but nothing was told if where the macroeconomic conditions also affect this premium.
Well, in this paper, what I, I showed you that macroeconomic risk matters, and uh, it matters especially for skewness and kurtosis risk premia. Also, there are two components which decide the size of this premium, such as market risk and financial constraints. Um, and finally, uh, I do not find any significant evidence that tells us that changing macroeconomic conditions have some forecasting power over the future stock returns. And uh, that's going to be my conclusion over it. Um, Thank you very much for listening. All right. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. Can you just repeat your last sentence? That of a stock return. Uh, do not find. I do not find any. Oh, sorry. Maybe I'm a little bit. Uh, what I mean is that the lagged. So if you observe some changes in macroeconomic conditions, like change in inflation and so on, right. it doesn't give you any, um, any information about future costs. Of risk premium. Yeah. Right. That's I it. I think you said stock returns. But oh, did I? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Any more questions? Comments? Critiques? Basically, if you have mm -hmm. locked in the paper, it means actually uh, correlation, uh, time correlation are opposite. You have first your, yes, for sir. example, if you yep. say your microeconomic mm -hmm. actually locked yeah. market risk, it means market risk your forward in the paper. Yeah. Macroeconomic mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. backward. Yeah, the, this is this what I do in the predictive regressions. But here I'm looking at uh, the contemporaneous, so they're happening at the same time. So this this happening at the same time, this happening. This is just to control if there is any alter correlation in the data. So if macroeconomic cannot predict market yeah. risk, it should be opposite. So so that could be a good uh, thing to test. Thank you. Um. Um, so you mean is that if there is no Granger causality coming from here, there could be a reverse Granger causality. Well, I haven't tested for this, and there could be something in there. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Have you thought about looking at it for, say, um, the certain bond market in the US Treasury? Uh, yeah, the bond market actually was done uh, by Ludwigsen and NG, and uh, I used a kind of similar identification but a bit simplified strategy when I was dealing with PCAs. Because, because I would have expected there maybe to be a type, like there would be more mm. closer correlation. Maybe, yeah. Because, because you'd expect there to be with inflation, because there's mm. inflation targeting in terms yeah, um, well, here I was focusing on stock market, but uh, could be interesting to see how, maybe if there are spillovers, like uh, stock and bond spillovers, how they're affected by the mar macroeconomic variables. And make any more questions? <coughs> right. Any other questions? No. Nope. Uh, any questions? No. no. In that no. case, you can ask them at the bar. Okay. We're about to go downstairs mm -hmm. to the bar. Thank you very much, yeah. Ian. For Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. for asking questions and and Said. Uh, and Said always asks questions. Uh, so, um, I think, um, what was I going to say? Uh, I was just going to, like, very, very quickly, <coughs> perhaps, reiterate, you know, our schedule um, for the for the coming mm -hmm. um, for the coming um, for the coming month and a half. Um, on the 27th of June, we have Demiana Briga at 6 p.m. in Canary Wharf, and you can watch football afterwards um, mm -hmm. at the bar. Um, uh, uh, that's 27th of June, right? <coughs> 20th of June, we have in New York, Casper Larson, uh, talking about TWAP training in continuous time equilibria. 
um, smart TVAC trading. Um, then on 11th of July we have Sophie Bismuth who will introduce the basics and applications of quantum computation. Um, uh, that's going to be our first quantum computing talk here. Uh, on the 25th of July we have Esther Vershoff who will talk about explaining and stopping pattern formation in tumors. It's going to be our first talk on medical rather than financial applications. And we have many more exciting talks coming up um, and we'll let you know very, very soon. Just wanted to mention real, real quick, we mentioned what Tequila do. Uh, Thalesians are about to organize uh, a summer school in Python programming um, that's going likely to be less than a week. It's probably going to be two days from scratch, uh, maybe two or three days. So if you want to program in Python, right, it doesn't matter if you've never programmed, right? You, we will teach you to program. Um, and um, after that, we have a summer school in machine learning. So we ran a workshop a couple of um, a couple of uh, months ago that was oversubscribed. We're going to do a full week of machine learning with an emphasis on uh, time series forecasting. It's likely to take place either at level, uh, on level 39 or at Oxford University. And if it does take place at Oxford University, you'll be staying uh, at one of the colleges for a week. And it would actually be most likely Christchurch. And we will teach you machine learning, including deep learning. Um, so that will be our summer school in machine learning. Uh, it's coming up, it's most likely to be the first week of September, we think. Right. And the Python training is likely to take place on level 39 just before the um, machine learning course. Uh, and of course we are building up our consulting business as well. So we have people who consult on various subjects listed here but not limited to what's, what's listed here. So in case you are interested in various applications of these things, please talk to us. Uh, and of course we are looking for contributors to the TSA library Jan has recently contributed. Maybe you can mention real quick what your code does. Well, it's uh, Armagarch model, um, just fitting uh, our simple Armagarch and calculating the uh, conditional volatilities. And we still so haven't incorporated it properly into yeah. TSA. We're looking into. We're we're looking for some help perhaps with TSA because uh, um, mm. it's quite interesting. It has a lot of stuff for stochastics, and we're trying mm. to somehow find these connections between machine learning and stochastics and uh, and progress both mm. uh, disciplines. And of course. Once again, congratulations to Hans Peter for an extremely successful uh, first talk in Vienna with about 60 people um, coming to listen to Ivan Duncan and Duke Vieira Machado. So that was very, very, the lessons were very, very well received in Vienna. We're about to start, again, the focus is likely to be more on mach machine learning applications as well as quantitative finance. We're about to launch the lessons Paris and the lessons Lisbon. And uh, last but not least, uh, I mentioned before that my PhD supervisor, Abbas Abdelat, uh, who um, supervised uh, my work in uh, mathematical logic, uh, has been held in Iran uh, in prison uh, for the past three months uh, without any sentence. Um, he remains in prison. So if there are any people who perhaps have any uh, knowledge of the situation or perhaps uh, have some, some way of somehow influencing this situation uh, in a positive way because uh, we think this is an absolute mistake um, Abbas has never uh, said anything other than good things about uh, uh, the Iranian nation and the Iranian people we think it's a terrible mistake and if anyone has any way of perhaps influencing the situation please talk to me um, because I've known Abbas since 2001 and it's a great shame that this is happening on a more positive note we look forward to seeing you at our forthcoming events and uh, we very much hope that uh, Talesians will establish themselves as leaders in the new science of machine learning. So we are aiming to produce not only good seminars and trainings, we are working on some exciting new ideas and new content. So thank you ever so much and look forward to seeing you very soon.